music, news, interviews, live events, and more. Welcome to the Hivecast with Matt Pinfield. Here I am with Maynard James Keenan, who you know from many bands, obviously. Perfect Circle, Tool. One of the hardest working men, I have to say, not only in music, but in general. I mean, it blows my mind. How I, set up, I set up all these lights. Yeah. I focused all these cameras. You did. Actually, I, you made I, it out. You got me hosting built 120 this, minutes again. I built this furniture. <laughs> you did? Yeah. Pretty pussy guy. With my bare hands. Hey, talk to me about Pusifer. It's Pusifer because it, that's the right pronunciation always, right? Pusifer. Pusifer. Oh, yeah. it's Pusifer. Okay, I love it. Puss in Boots. All right, yeah. You wouldn't say Puss in Boots, would yeah. you? No, I wouldn't ever. Pussifer, <laughs> all right? Which, you know, the first time we heard about Pussifer, which was, the, you know, the fictional band member back on uh, Mr. Show with Bob and Dave back then. Mm -hmm. And was that how long ago you were thinking about this when you started working uh, on the comedy thing? It actually started before then. I was doing a, I was trying to figure out a way to, to have an independent project that was a multimedia project. Uh, and the first thing we did was the Free Francis Bean shirt, the, yeah. which predated the Mr. Show yeah. uh, uh, episode. Um, just trying to use a t-shirt to just kind of like get the funding going because we wanted to do animation, we wanted to do film, we wanted to do uh, you know, uh, uh, graphic novel stuff and performance and all these things, and just back uh, mid uh, mid nineties, it just financially you couldn't do it. Yeah. Uh, all the all the hurdles you had to jump. But do a video that we wanted to do would cost a million bucks. Nowadays we can do it for a thousand bucks. Yeah. On your laptop with yeah. a Canon 5D. I mean, the amazing thing is that because you have the opportunity to buy equipment that works as good as the equipment did back then, and uh -huh. you can, it's just like recording at home. Yeah. So, we, speaking of that, when you started and you did, you did the first record, V is for Vagina, huh. and I remember The Undertaker, one of the other things, a Rent Holder remix was the first one that I was heard it was on a soundtrack, like, right. uh, for a movie, and we, we heard that, we loved that, and then before the V is for Vagina record came out, right. you got to tell me about, before we get into the characters and the whole overall feeling of what Pussifer is about, <laughs> one of my favorites... Which could take hours. <laughs> yes, the album cover... Was it Vagina Airlines? Was that what it was? Yeah. Tell me, that was one of the funniest pieces of, that was one of the greatest album covers. Well, one of the continuing themes that, I'd, that I've been doing since we put that record. Is well, the Airlines to host this, right? Yeah, but we have, uh, we have you know, on that album, like each, each piece of artwork, uh, if you buy that album like four times, there's different, there's different artworks in it. We changed up the art in every, in every uh, release, pretty yeah. much. But continuing on like Instagram and on Twitter and stuff we you know we fly a lot and there's always just ridiculous stuff and it kind of came from you know Fight Club when they redid all the yeah. all the airline stuff and stuck them in all the seats yeah uh, it just kind of came from that where just the ridiculousness of some of these stuff that you know that's in those in those safety guides yeah and so I, I've been photographing stuff as we fly too. I just photograph when it's like what are they really trying to do in this picture yeah so just, we'll just post well, it and so just it let, people let, let people comment on what it is and just wonder well, what the artist was thinking when they did this. <laughs> the one about how to what is that? children yeah. was unbelievable, <laughs> yeah. was so on PC. And yeah. then the, you know, I mean... And, you but, know, the airline, but the ones in the plane aren't, aren't much different. They really are. Yeah, I mean, we, we did some twists to the art ourselves to make it, you know, to kind of mold it to the jokes that we were trying to tell. But... Uh, the ones in the airline are actually funnier because yeah. they they have. I mean, <laughs> I mean, unless you have Sully Sullenberger, right? The guy who actually lands in the Hudson River, and it was like, I mean, a miracle guy yeah. who kept his cool Hats and found a him. way to do it. I mean, that's not the norm. That's the no. anomaly. Yeah. You know, what comes down to is, you know, some of the things are ridiculous in there because you know, if you're going down, it's not going to matter if you can pull out your bottom of your seat to float. If you're going down, you're you're going down. Yeah. You're done. Yeah. Good luck. You know. You remember that Catherine Wheel video years ago for Way Down, and it has the really sinister-looking stewardess, and they're going down in the plane. That freaked a lot of people out years ago when we showed. No, that I do not one. remember that one. Yeah, I'll just, you, know, <laughs> you should check it out though. It's really good because again, it reminds me of that. All right, so so let's talk about. I want to talk about the shows that you did, and conditions of my parole. Let's talk about the most recent Pussifer record, okay? And the shows that you did, the multimedia shows, starting with the record. I love the idea because of you working, living in Arizona now, in that area, near Jerome and near near Sedona. Through your experiences, you, you created these characters and you went on this kind of tour of the wildlife and the things that were going on there. What inspired that? Was it living up there? To, you know, yeah, I've been there, that. this is my 17th year living in Arizona. Yeah. You know, just, you're kind of reacting to the things you see. And it's such a, such a twisted valley. You have, you know, so many different kinds of people living there. 
a lot of uh, people that fled Los Angeles are there. It's funny how I run into a lot of people from Michigan and Ohio and even Boston in the area. Odd, odd, yeah. odd mix of people. Um, We're getting better weather, that's for sure, yeah. regardless. The bartenders in the bar I go to are all from New York City. Like, yeah. You know, straight up accent, like, how long have you been here? 20 years. But you sound like you're from New York. Because I am. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, a, it's just an odd mix of people there. The valley itself is, uh, we're in a high desert, so we yeah. get, a, you know, it's get a little bit more weather up there than you see in Phoenix. Uh, we get snow in the winter. We get a lot more monsoon uh, weather yeah. uh, up there. And it gets hot in the summer, but not, not like, uh, not Phoenix hot. So. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's a mix of, you know, spiritual people and Republicans and Democrats and hippies and artisans and farmers and it's just a, an odd mix uh, of people. So you get a lot of characters up there. So just these things, some of these songs practically wrote themselves, just witnessing what you know what you witness. When just you being there. observing the people that are mm -hmm. up there. Absolutely. Which I think is amazing. Now. It's that area near Jerome. It's considered the most haunted town in America, or is it just claimed to be? Or I mean, what is what is the situation? It's a it's a it's a strange town. It used to be a, an old copper mining town. Yeah. Uh, so it uh, it's seen its share of violence uh, back in the in the wild wild west, and you know, oddly enough, this year is our uh, this is the centennial for yeah. us. This is we have been a state for a uh, hundred years, 2012, uh, 1912, yeah. our statehood. So we are the last state uh, in the contiguous. Uh, union to to join like the last kid basically yeah. for the last child and so it's you know it's pretty inspiring to be there for this uh, celebration are you gonna look backward I mean will, will then maybe the next post for thing take some of that as well like looking back hard know. to say yeah pretty much when I came to visit you up there and I remember when you first started you know working on your wine and for, like first vines were being laid up up in that area I stayed in a hotel up there which was, was it once a mental hospital or something like no, that? No, it was, it was the hospital. I mean, it, it feels like a mental hospital because there's a lot of crazy stuff that went on up there. I mean, but, like, yeah. like the guy who hung himself in the, yeah. In the lobby. Yeah, the very much like the Overlook. Is that what it is? Yeah. So, yeah, from The Shining. Yeah. Yeah, similar similar uh, situation yeah. there. Yeah, it, like, it was a great experience. I loved yeah. when I went to stay at that hotel. Not the hanging part. Yeah, not the hanging part was not a good experience, but <laughs> not for him at least. But when we went there, I loved when I went to the hotel and they, you could actually... They would give you to go watch in your room. There are sightings for ghosts. One of the sightings, uh, mm -hmm. you know, unsolved mysteries, yeah. like all these things. You could go in your hotel, you know, your hotel room and go, "Hey, let me see what happened here." Originally, still on VHS, by the way. Yeah, which is fantastic. They haven't converted those. To you know, I'm, I'm one of those guys who actually took it into my room and watched it that evening. All right, it was fun because you didn't want to sleep, is what <laughs> yeah, you said. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> every little creak, every little yeah, noise, no, no, kept me awake, which was pretty amazing. Characters again for Pussifer. I mean, music's great too. Uh, these characters, um, you know, let's start with Hildy and Billy D, who are kind mm. of the married couple at Trailer Park, inbred pretty much, like their cousins and they're married, yeah. right? Tell us about them. Uh, <laughs> well, the, the the core of that, they, the their inception coincided with us performing uh, Country Boner back in the day when we were doing that stuff. That was your first single. Yeah, right? <laughs> way back, way back in the yeah, day, yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, Laura, Laura sang on that. And so those characters, that, that song, we just wanted a, an excuse to play the song. <laughs> so we had to invent these characters around this song and see, you know, who are these people. And as time went on, we ended up just, you know, living in, in, the, in the valley of, uh, you know, the Verde Valley of Arizona. We went, I think I know who these characters are now, because all these other pieces kind of fall into place. And you start to tell their story, you know, and they're, yeah. uh, they're basically a, a couple who are, they're basically, it's a country band. Yeah. But they're just absolutely convinced they're a punk rock band. Something's, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. in their mind, they moved from Xenia, Ohio to Arizona and they are anar anarchists. Yeah. And they're punk rockers, but they're not. They're absolutely yeah. like this. And does anybody else take them seriously? Is that? No. No. No, of course what not. about this guy who who was an ex-military guy, but still never takes off his, his uniform? Major douche. Well, that's see, there's a, there's another developing story there. He's if you really look at his uniform, he has no idea how to actually lay out his his stuff. So there might be another another side of the story for Mr. Douche. In the on the next chapter, yeah, after conditions yeah. of my there's, gonna, yeah, there's more. There's more. There's more to Mr. Major Douche than meets the eye. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and that will come out later. That's great. Now, are these guys unrelated? Peter Merkin and Dick Merkin. Are they or are they related? Uh, we'll connect those dots at some point. Okay, that sounds good. The story is unfolding. <laughs> These characters are amazing. It's <laughs> great. Now, I mean, Peter Merkin, uh, we, we're going to keep uh, uh, bringing him back and forth because yeah. uh, his 
he actually blew up. Yeah. But a la, you, you mean know, he exploded spin- like the drummer Spinal Tap? Absolutely. Okay. But but uh, we thought he did, but he's yeah. actually he didn't. So he didn't. rather than like exploding drummers, yeah. we have one guy who we keep we think keeps exploding, yeah. and he keeps coming back. Yeah. You know, so car accidents, comes yeah, back abducted in. by aliens, but now he's back. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. And, you know, mostly he's just hiding because he stole something. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's good. Now, you've done two sold out. I mean, I remember when the last time you came around, about 2011, you sold out the Apollo and, you know, up in Harlem. Mm-hmm. And another show was at the Beacon, too. Both. We actually did the country set at the Apollo, which was kind of nice to do, like, <laughs> the country set by the band that thinks it's punk rock, but at the Apollo. <laughs> It couldn't beat that. And the staff there was like, okay, what are we getting into here? They weren't sure about, you know, you could tell like any minute now they're going to say, you know what, wrap it up. You guys got to get out of here. <laughs> but they ended up being, the, they were really into it. So it's yeah. kind of fun. Especially they were into it because it was sold out. I'm sure that didn't yeah. hurt their feelings that doesn't, at all. Yeah. Which, uh, I think I'm, they were afraid that we were actually there was going to be more like aggressive people coming to the show. Oh, you mean like but the I, people in, in the Blues Brothers who were throwing like bottles and yeah, rawhide? Yeah. And keep, your, keep them doggies rolling? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> kind of like that. Yeah, I think okay. they were a little worried that that was going to go on. But once they saw the audience in this show, they yeah. were free. They, were, they, they had a good time. They were smiling. That's very cool. Now, you know, you're really the only central member in, uh, of Pussifer and... You know, it kind of rotates around you with a lot of different musicians. Generally speaking, now that's kind of changed a little bit. Matt Mitchell is definitely a cornerstone. He's in uh, it now, really. Project. He's kind of right. like, uh, uh, he's my Martin Gore. Yeah. Now, where Matt Mitchell? Uh, you want to tell, explain to people what, how you know Matt? And where he, he comes from? I met him through Billy Howardell. He was yeah. our uh, our tech, yeah. you know, kind of our backline guy, programming stuff. That he was he was working with us on the road with Perfect Circle, and then he ended up helping us on. Uh, I don't know if he actually helped us on 13 Step, but he definitely helped on Emotive. Yeah. Uh, and then I, started, I was actually working with him at that point, trying to pull some of the original uh, Pussifer tracks together. Yeah. Um, so, so that's that's his background, and he he's a solid dude. He knows a lot of people and understands how to put together a project as yeah. far as the behind the scenes production, put all the pieces together, make it work seamlessly. Yeah. He's he's that guy. Well, when you have like, I mean, there's been as many as 15 people on stage with you at certain times, mm-hmm. including your son, Devo, yes. who plays cello. He's never actually on stage. We keep him off the stage for now. you got to wait until yeah. he's about 26 yeah. before we pull him out. You want to keep your people, yeah, yeah I keep, keep him out of, Keep him out of this just awful, on the record stuff. awful, awful business until yeah. it's too late. <laughs> You're like, you know what? But, he's, but he, is, he loves music, right? And he, and yeah, he, has, he plays cello. Which, yeah. is, which is cool. I mean, he played on Billy Howardale's record, Ashes Divide, as well. I remember yep. he played on that. Yep, and he played on, uh, on Monsoons, yeah. on the new record. Yeah, which is very cool. Now, is that guy Matt Mitchell the same one who does some of the programming that I see, like when you do the Tool Show live and you got some... some no, that's a, a lot of that stuff ends up... Uh, it's Junior who runs our lights and uh, Breck who does a lot of the, the video stuff. Yeah. Junior also does... All, he's our LD on, on Pussifer as well. And Meets Meyer does a lot of the animation, but yeah. the other core guy for the for the project too is Josh Eustace, who Telephone Tel Aviv. Yeah, uh, he's kind of our, our the for piece for for Pussifer. For Pussifer, yeah. yeah. And uh, he he uh, he was involved with Danny Loner on the original uh, some of the original tracks from Underworld. But, yeah, uh, and I've continued that relationship for a long time uh, through. So he's kind of a, a core guy now for kind of meeting that. I have a I have a silly idea, and then yeah. Matt and Josh yeah. figure out what I mean by what the hell it was I just said. You're like, what? Let's try and turn this into something. <laughs> Interpret what the heck he just said. I mean, you've had other old friends, guys you've known with, or known or toured with, or been friends from the earliest days. To like, you know, Tim Alexander from mm-hmm. Primus has played, mm-hmm. um, and. Um, Brad Wilkes played it right over the time. Uh, Brad and Tim and Johnny Polanski, we kind of got together initially for some an, an idea. We were going to maybe do some project, and I was right in the middle of Pussifer, and we started kind of writing some stuff, and the song that came out of that was Mama Said. Yeah. Uh, but then they, they got back into Rage, and they were kind of going off on tour, and I was heading out with Pussifer, and it just kind of, you know, yeah. nothing really came of it. But. You know, I love the, char- the Merkin characters that are in there, too, um, and... Let's get back to Merkin Vineyards too, and, and talk about you know you had this uh, this celebrated documentary that's now out, out on DVD um, called Blood Into Wine, all about your your vineyards, the winery, and, and your your exploration into in doing wine. I remember you know one of my favorite experiences that I'll never forget is you showing me your wine cellar in Arizona, and it was one. And of then the- having to drag you out of my wine cellar. <laughs> You didn't have hair. I couldn't figure out what to grab. I know, because well, I was ready for the wine at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it was incredible. I mean, the gobo lights in your wine cellar were incredible. The one that says, because, of course, everybody talks about wine being the blood of Christ. The, the gobo light that says, behold the blood of Christ, was like, I was like, that's one of the coolest things. And then Port, Italy, you know, the gobo lights around there. It was, mm-hmm. it was one of the most impressive wine cellars, I imagine, me not being 
an expert by any means. I've done, drank my share of it. But <laughs> you were in White Spectator magazine. How, you know, did you enjoy doing that too? I remember that great you know, article. Yeah, they they did a little article on some of the some of the collection. I sent them some photos in, and then later on, I did a little blog, kind of keeping people up to date on what we were doing in Arizona in general, because yeah. uh, it's a very uh, daunting prospect to just kind of start breaking ground. Although there are people who did it before us, uh, yeah. turn of the century. Prohibition pretty much interrupted a lot of that, uh, yeah. trying to trying to do some of those things, and it's just such a financial wall uh, between you and starting a vineyard and a winery. Yeah. And most people just didn't really back into it, and uh, U.S. public opinion didn't really understand wine and how integral it is to like developing a small, sustainable uh, economy in your in your local area. Yeah. Uh, any any little area that has a solid vineyard growing that has some success, sees collateral benefit from all the little industries around it. It's, it's yeah. kind of a solidifier yeah. in a way. So we're seeing that now. Uh, it's taken a while. Yeah. Um, but uh, so, you know, I was kind of telling that story on our website and through Wine Spectator. And uh, now it's kind of, and now it's progressed to the point where we have, you know, easily twice as many wineries, uh, licensed bonded wineries in Arizona than we did 10 years ago. So yeah. So, well, so I'm nice. thinking about when I first came out up to your house and they were first put laying vines on the side of the, uh, the hill there. And then I've heard you've got, you've moved out and done a lot of production outside of there or growing is what I mm -hmm. should say. Now, is that in the similar area or is that? In, uh, I'm actually planting more in that area uh, over the next year or two years because again, financial yeah. hurdle to get over it. Uh, it, I'm planting 28 acres in northern Arizona and an additional, you know, a couple, you know, around the area. And then in southern Arizona, we have two existing vineyards down there that we purchased with Arizona Stronghold Vineyards yeah. uh, for that project. There's about 160 acres in southern Arizona that we're in the process now of, of tidying up and fixing because we just kind of got them for a song and a dance. And now yeah. it's time to, like, really, you know, f put a little bit more money to really fix them because they definitely were you know, some stuff that was questionable. You know, yeah. you just, you just, there's grapes you don't grow in the desert. Yeah. And some of the blocks were planted with some of those grapes. So kind of got out of them what we wanted to get out of them, yeah. but now it's time to and change it. And moved on. And yeah, we got we to gotta figure out, <laughs> fine tune, figure out what grows best there. Because you don't, you know, you don't want to just limp along. You want to plant the best grapes because you want to present the yeah. best representation of this place yeah. that you can. You're listening to The Hivecast with Matt Pinfield. So tell me about when you did that tour that they followed in the documentary Blood into Wine. And you had gone around and you know you'd also like you know your fans of you from Tool, Perfect Circle, Pussifer came out and, and you know you actually did some signings. You sold wine to the people. Tell me how how successful did you feel that that whole trip was? Uh, I felt like that was just kind of scratching the surface, uh, just introducing a lot of the people to that stuff. I mean the goal would be if as those people you know grow up and their uh, attitude towards wine develops. Hopefully they'll hang on to that bottle, yeah. and then in you know five six years they'll open it up when they're ready to yeah. actually experience what's happening in the bottle. And so that initial run was more just like to let them know that there's this thing happening. They're not going to process it. They're not going to quite. It's not going to sink in for the majority of the people that came through the, yeah. that time. But eventually it might. Eventually, you know, yeah. all of a sudden, you know, the right moment, the right meal, the right people. They open the bottle. It all clicks. They, mm -hmm. It makes sense. Yeah. And then you have you know you have somebody who's going to maybe. Not necessarily be a customer forever. More, more importantly, like go. Oh wow, if he can do that there, yeah. maybe I can do that here. And yeah. they start looking around their area, and helping assist in developing uh, a sustainable industry around their. Speaking their of town. sustainable, people talk about with all the problems with the economy that we really do have to localize growth of wine of vegetables, food, everything that agriculturally we do because, you know, eventually it's, it's going to be a big, a big important part of what's wrong with the economy and, you know, I mean, right. what, what do you think? Uh, well, yeah, the, uh, the beautiful part about uh, winemaking and, uh, and specifically vineyards and where they're from and a winemaker kind of getting out of the way to let that place speak for itself is once you've established what, that's, what that place has to say through wine, it's not an industry you can move. Yeah. You can't outsource it to China or yeah. move it to Mexico. This is here. This is from here. And, and, it, and it took decades for this thing to really express where it's from. So in, that, in those decades of it developing there, again, industries have established themselves around it, and you're dug in. You're committed to that area. And so the other people can actually make a living locally, sustainably, around some of those little cornerstones that kind of establish themselves. Yeah. You have people that end up being more aware of where their food comes from. Yeah. Yeah, that's all. That's how it kind of starts going. You go, hmm, where's my water come from? Yeah. How does my food grow? 
Yeah. When you realize that there's those those are things that you can collect and grow on your own. Yeah. You are definitely a piece of the of the solution rather than a part of the problem. Yeah, that's and it's a good thing to be. Now, one of the wines you named after your mother, right, Judith, in memory yeah. of your mom, mm -hmm. like the song from Perfect Circle from the first record. Murder and there's Rose. a wine called Marzo as well from a, a my great great grandfather. He used to make wine in northern Italy. I didn't realize that I had a great grandfather making wine. Yeah. In northern Italy, uh, it was a, a family member who had contacted me, uh, knew that I was into wine, and said, yeah. "Hey, you realize that your great great grandfather." Here, sorry, my great grandfather made wine in northern Italy. I had no idea. So now I've done the research. I've actually started. Did you go on the Ancestry.com or did you find out more? No, about I ended up finding a, a distant relative, contacted another distant yeah. relative who showed up in the tasting room with a bunch of photos of Marzo yeah. uh, from northern so Italy. So you named the wine after him. Which yeah, well, I actually cool. named the wine before they showed up. Which so so he, came, he actually came to get a bottle of the wine named after his great grandfather. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I mean, that must have been a cool So, yeah, so now I've got all this information how, what, how for the area. How much family do you have over there? I mean, no idea. That's what I'm trying to find out. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you might want to go at ancestry.com. You know, yeah. don't know what you're looking yeah. for. Well, a lot, of the, looking. a lot of the records were destroyed, uh, you know, during World War One and Two. So yeah. a lot of the, a lot of that area, it's kind of hard to track any of that stuff because entire towns were leveled. So yeah. those records were on paper. What yeah. are you going to do? Exactly. So, before we're trying to figure it out. But that's really cool that they showed up for that. I think mm -hmm. that's pretty amazing. amazing Absolutely. Amazing thing. Um, you know, the other thing I have to ask you is, um, going back to, to Pussifer for a moment, mm -hmm. can you tell people a bit about, about those early days of you doing stuff with comedy? How did you get involved in that in the first place? You know, becoming friends, you and David Cross, Janine Garofalo, all these people that you have a long relationship with. I mean, there's a lot of other actors I know you're friends with. You know, Jason Schwartzman's done stuff with you, a ton of people, but and you have these relationships. He with has? Huh? I don't what? Know. Just... <laughs> <laughs> no, so go ahead. So. Uh, it was back, uh, I, you know, my roommate Gary used to take me to, uh, um, he got me to go to uh, Uncabaret one night to go yeah. see uh, Patton Oswalt. Yeah. And uh, I think maybe Brian Pesane was performing or something. You know, yeah. Early days, just like to see these people doing their thing. Yeah. And it was like immediately like a drug. It's like, okay, I'm in. So yeah. just trying to hang out with all these people and uh, getting hooked up with Laura Milligan when she was doing Tantrum. Watching Bob and Dave work out their earlier stuff uh, back, in, you know, during that period of time, going to Cafe Largo. It was a nice, it was a nice, uh, solid group of people back then. Were just trying to find their way, yeah. and all these little places were them just trying to get their chops together. So, yeah. you know, Tantrum was for me was more where I ended up being uh, spending more time with yeah. uh, Laura Milligan, because you know, she had all these people coming through. Like Tenacious D would close the show. Uh, then Pussifer would close it, you know, another night, you know, we would do some project that was basically Pussifer based, uh, you know, project that was tied to Laura and her character that was presenting this variety show. You know, a lot of people would uh, be working their chops out there, you know, Craig Anton would be there, um, uh, Brian Pesane, Bob and David, Jeanine Garofalo, you know, a lot of, oh, yeah. just a lot of, you know, Karen Kilgariff and uh, Marilyn Lynn Rice Cub would be yeah. doing her thing, so it was, it was very inspiring to watch. Well, the from uh, from Twenty Four, right? Mm -hmm. So she was in comedy first. Funny. She, She's funny. What was her name in Twenty Four? She's great. In I it. don't I know. Her name. She All was I know, of, they you kept know. her. She was a normal people. They kept the longest. <laughs> they kept her like to the end. Yeah. You know, she was yeah. like one person. Everybody else died, but her and Kiefer. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's just like I've heard that about Jonathan Togo, who's like really into cool music. The guy who plays Ryan Wolf in CSI Miami. Mm -hmm. I hear he's like a funny dude, mm -hmm. but you don't get to tell, see that on the other serious right. dramas. What right. are you gonna do? Are you, you, <laughs> <laughs> now you, um, you, you Whenever I watch CSI in Miami, all I'm looking at is H. Yeah. <laughs> he's like the new Superman. H he's, he, yeah, he's the new he's the oh, new Captain Kirk. Sunglasses are great. Well, yeah. I asked Jonathan Togo, because you know he's a big one twenty fan. In fact, he was in a band with the guys from the Bravery in college called Scaba the Hut. <laughs> <laughs> he played trumpet. So the guy, you know, right? <laughs> I think I knew. I see a new Pussifer sketch yeah, coming. Yeah, I want to do it. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, go, going back to those, you know, they have they have all these things that go on where they, where I think they can't do a lot of stuff outside their characters. Mm -hmm. it's, it's that's one of the deals. I wanted to ask you again. You know, I've known for years that you trained trained with the legendary Brazilian family, the Gracies. Mm -hmm. um, tell people a little bit about that, and you're still doing that, aren't you? You're, a little bit. Yeah. yeah, I train a little bit when we travel. Uh, um, Explain to people what, what it is. As you, <laughs> well, as you approach forty-eight, you don't do much of anything anymore. Yeah. But uh, you look great for yeah. forty-eight. You know, we were looking last time. I'm like, man, you look. I'm actually only twenty-seven. Yeah, I know. So I don't look so great now. 
You still look good. 27, man. You, you don't really you don't really look that good for 27. <laughs> you look great. No, you look good for 27. Tell us. <laughs> Maynard. Seriously, though. No. Tell me about how the, you got involved with the Gracies, because you were really involved. And I remember training for, you know, years. Yeah, I, uh, I We trained, almost got I, something going. I trained for many years, uh, and then I ended up getting injured and had to step out of it for a while. Plus, you know, the you know touring is such an... An insane schedule. If you if you're a guy on the road trying to do music, the music business, uh, it's almost impossible to really maintain. And uh, and if you've done any kind of uh, you know any kind of martial art like that, especially as tr as taxing as uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu can be or mixed martial arts, you kind of have to be in that dojo wherever you're training. You have to kind of be there quite often and quite regularly and get the right kind of sleep. I mean, people understand like airports, buses, hotel oh. rooms. It's not solid. And you especially, I mean, I don't know about how well you sleep on planes, but man, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. I don't care if I'm horizontal. I remember one time going to do a thing with you two from LA, so it was a ten hour one, not from like from here. I don't care if you got it one of those. If you're, you're you can lay down, I still can't sleep in those no. things, man. You know, you got to order the bassinet with the uh, with the Vicodin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got to get the Vicodin. <laughs> Then you're good. <laughs> then you're all right, <laughs> which is cool. But yeah, I remember you. We, we even talked about you actually doing a show at one time. We were, you and I were looking into figuring out a way to get a show on the air about you and the, the Gracies. Yeah, that's that's, cool. that's old news now, isn't it? Yeah. The, what's the one they have on there? I never watched. Did they actually have one on there? They have something. I don't know. Some martial art thing. Yeah. I, get the, I don't watch that kind of <laughs> yeah. stuff. Here, here I am, like I'm talking about CSI Miami. I'm like, oh, I don't watch those things. I don't watch those shows. Yeah. <laughs> I watch it, man. I'll, I'll be the first to admit. Hypocrite. Yeah. <laughs> it's great stuff, though. So what's next up? You're, you're on this tool tour. You guys are finished. like a 25-city tour. Huh. And then I'm sure you'll get back to working with Pussifer again. And yeah, I got a, I got a, we're going back to celebrate the Arizona Centennial yeah. uh, on the 11th and 12th in Phoenix. And then uh, I had to do some racking and stuff in the winery. There's, you know, it's, it's time to kind of like start getting that together because I'm going to be bottling at the yeah. beginning of April. So, yeah. got to get back, got to tidy up some of this, the winery stuff, and then uh, hit the road with Pussifer on the second leg of this uh, album. Uh, yeah, conditions of my parole. Yeah, I love that name, conditions of my parole, and the fact that you're going through the crazy wildlife uh, ghost towns. It's, it's a, it's a small, you know, as we discussed, it's a. It's an independent project. We don't have any underwriters or sponsors or a label. So. You, you've self-financed this entire thing. Yeah, pretty much. Right. And, and, and from the beginning, because I, I, I'm very cautious not to just dump other sources of income into this. I'm, I've been very conscious from the beginning of starting it from what it is. Like that t-shirt, that initial t-shirt funded the recording of the first song. Yeah. And then that song sales funded the next t-shirts. Yeah. And then those, you just kind of like make it so that it's a self-funded project from the yeah. ground up. And because of that, because you don't, there's not a lot of fingers in the pie. Yeah. You get no outside support. You don't get like just radio support going. Oh, we'll help you. Yeah. You know, they're not super supportive. So, yeah. you're on your own. So you have this next tour, and we announce the dates, and there's a bunch of people going, "Hey, man, why aren't you going to come to New York? I've been to New York three times. Ding dong. Where, yeah. where, where were you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know. So no. So nobody really knows because it's not. It's not something that's uh, part of the machine that just delivers you the information yeah. right. You know. Right. You know force feeds you basically yeah so we're not a part of that system so nobody really unless you're looking for it you don't know that it's happening yeah i mean in the last year besides doing working with, with the vineyards you know doing and rotating tours you've always been very careful to make sure that you separate it at the right time when you do perfect circle tool uh, pussifer and everything else which is amazing but I, I it blows my mind where do you get you, got, you have incredible energy to do these things and to stay extremely focused i think is one of those things is it because i mean could coffee you, huh coffee coffee Coffee. You have one of the and water. Listen, you have one of the greatest coffee makers, espresso, is an espresso maker in your house or coffee makers I've ever seen. You want to buy it? No. no that's, uh, <laughs> I don't think I can afford it. How much are you selling it for? You ever, is it still there? Yeah, I got to get rid of it. You do? Yeah, I'm moving on. <laughs> in a smaller unit that doesn't take as much back pain. It literally, <laughs> the thing was gigantic. It's like it's this big, It's a full on it? lever machine and you got to yeah. like, you got to rub it and, and talk to it. And yeah. It's, you still it's, got the, are your cats still school. doing good? You're the hairless cats? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're doing well. What are their names again? Uh, Esmeralda. The other yeah. one's the other one's left. The other one's left the building. Yeah, I, one of them's a super problem cat. Yeah. Uh, he was really a, just kind of a bully. Yeah. So what? Hey so Trent. Beat up the other one. Hey Trent, you want a cat? <laughs> Did you give it to Trent? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Every now and then I hear like, ah, fucking cat. 
get a call from Trent Reznor going, Maynard, why don't you give Change my number and change my email. I was like, oh, I moved. I moved. I don't know. It's That's like unbelievable. A, I guess you, you have to keep be, the cat. You must have been proud to see him win uh, the Oscar for Oh, yeah, hours, absolutely. Man. He's worked hard on that. Him and Atticus, man. I'm, I'm super. Atticus super, Ross is great. Yeah. Super proud of those guys. Yeah. Now, your friendship with Trent has come back for so long as well. Well, there was that project you guys were, were considering doing for a while, right? Did you ever do any recording? Well, I mean, if you look at the Pussifer project, to me, that's what that was going to be. Yeah. Because uh, you know, Undertaker that, sounded like something. That yeah, we were, we were, you know, those days when we were getting together, I don't think, uh, I don't think everybody who was involved in that project wasn't quite ready to do that project. Yeah. There were so many other things going on and so many outside influences and, you know, my huge ego coming to the table and everybody else's egos coming to the table. It just really polluted the project and yeah. we, just weren't, we just weren't ready. And people going through things in personal lives yeah. too. So I think, you know, now that we've come, this, you know, things are going, Pussifer's kind of become what I thought that I, that, that should have been. What was been. it going to be called? I can't remember the name of it. Tapeworm. Tapeworm, right? right. Yeah, it was a cool word. It was a cool name. Yeah, it just know? wasn't, I don't think it was ever going to get off the ground at that time. Right, yeah. And now there's no point in doing it right, because everybody's not doing it yeah, right yeah now. you know Pussifer's gone he's got the soundtrack uh, the yeah. score's gone so yeah. there's no point in going backwards yeah. just go forward the great thing is the friendships are all still there mm -hmm. you know it's crazy when people think about you know you, your, your friendship with Tool with Rage and all the other bands and knowing all you guys all being friends back then and you know Adam Jones from Tool and Morello going to school together mm -hmm. You know, when they both said we couldn't play any covers, the other guy in the other band with the feathered hair did the best journey covers. So mm -hmm. they got all the girls, and we had to write our own stuff, but right. it worked out better for everybody. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, know? for sure. It was great to have you here, man. This cool is my thirty. Year. This is the this is my thirty year reunion this year. Oh, your high school reunion? Yeah, thirty year. Now, are you in touch with any? I won't go back because huh? I'll be in the middle of harvesting grapes. But. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, do you stay in touch with any of those people you knew when you were like in high school or kids? Oh yeah, because I do. I mean, yeah, you know. I, Tell me about Especially it. the ones I didn't like, because I want to make sure that they, I rub it in. <laughs> yeah. No, good just kidding. <laughs> I know. No, I like, I like pretty much all my classmates. Yeah. It's a pretty small town. We had like, we were the largest graduating class coming through that school and for many, many years. And so we, that's, that's there were 100, 100 people. No, that was yeah. Michigan. Oh, Michigan, I mean. Yeah, yeah. What was the name of that town again? Uh, Mason County. Mason County, yeah. What, what's that near? Is it, how far is it from Detroit or East Lansing? Or? It's, uh, it's roughly... Uh, it's roughly 16 hour drive from Boston. Okay. What? <laughs> <laughs> For those out, watching from Boston, it's, it's out there. Get in your car and yeah. you can drive that thing. Try it. Try it. See it's, how it goes. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Maynard, thanks for coming in today. It was great to see you. This has been the Hivecast with Matt Pinfield. For all things music, news, interviews, live events, and more, go to mtvhive.com.